From the concrete jungle of Nairobi, we exposed traders endangering lives by selling you dodgy meats. We are coming after you right now. We are coming after you. Tonight, we lift another dark veil in the country's food chain. We will be testing samples of maize flour we've bought from shops. Maize has become a political crop. We will check for contamination and bring you the outcome as experts warn the ruthless backroom deals of the staple is a threat to all. We consume the same food, we live in the same environment, we are all predisposed. We speak to those who live to tell their story. My life just started, you know, going through my head. Oh, now I'm done. I already knew this is death. How can I go to Uganda? Toxins and preservatives are now fighting for shelf space. All the milk samples we took from that factory had aflatoxins and it was in the supermarket. It is serious because Kenyans use peanut butter everywhere. The delicious loaf of bread also spells danger. Why would a commodity like bread that would naturally attract a whole family of fungi within a very short time not show any sign of contamination one week after you have left it on the shelf? We'll continue going back to the same hospital. We'll continue having long queues in the hospitals. We stand outside this home, waiting for this door to open. As we wait patiently, we glance around in what felt like an abandoned home. A hot afternoon. Even the watcher was tired. The animals too are lazing around looking for inspiration. A meal is being prepared for us and we can't help a sense of foreboding because our interview today is about a meal, the Last Supper. It is the first time Susan Mutungwa is granting journalists an interview. At 74 years of age, her memory is still intact as she recalls an unforgettable event in 2004. <laughs> Tukakola, eh, uyo, uyo kijana wangu, haka konjeka. Eh, na uyo mse, na uyo mchuku wangu. Tukaenda hospitali. Uyo kijana haka paliki. Watu wanakuja hapa, wanatuchukua. Wana Tunaenda zote huku machakosi. Tukapima. Tukambewa nesumi. Susan remembers her family eating gideri for lunch that day, made from maize they had just harvested. She later cooked ugali, greens and vegetables for her family that fateful evening and charted away into the night. Usiku huo bada ya kula ugali, mze wako pamoja na kijana wako na mjuku wako, walikuwa na hisi vipi kwenye mwili kabla ya kwenda hospitali hiyo hiyo mchuku wangu amepora tumbo kawa hiyo na ikawa nyekundu kawa nyekundu hiyo mchuku wangu hiyo unao mse ndio alitapika sana Hata hiyo mtoto mwingine huyo huyo mlana wangu alikuwa analala huko anatapika anatapika lakini ameapoa. Na wewe ulikula pia ugali? Nilikula. Susan and her daughter were also hospitalized but later released and placed on prescription drugs. Gikola hiyo mindi nasikia tumba ikaniuma. Ngara hapana kutapika. Susan's husband, Wallace Mutungwa, died in hospital in Machakos that night. Doctors said 
he had ingested a lot of poison. His liver was damaged and all his organs had collapsed. Judah Mutungwa, their son, had just completed Form 4. He died a day after his father at Kola. Jimmy Mulungalu, their grandson who had just joined Standard 1, died a week later at Kenyatta National Hospital. Sasa toka sika ii ya watu. Ngaona sita mingi. Sita yaka niingia. Sasa nga nini akili yaka loka. Nini yaka nishika. Presha. Nini biyoto. Hmm. Although it's been 13 years since the tragedy, she still grieves for her husband. And the raw memories come flooding back. We have to stop the interview. Snaking around the hilly side of Eastern under the unforgiving sun, are these breathtaking therapeutic views and quiet hills. We head to the next village where another family that has been silent for years is ready to share their story. Nilikuwa mwaka wa 2010 tulipika ukali na mboka na usiku hiyo mwendo wa saa 9 hivi ndio mume wangu alisikia akiwa katika hali ya kuuma na tumbo akapitia jirani mwingine simu akaja akatukuta si sote mimi watoto wangu wazazi wawili baba na mama tukiwa wakonjwa Saa hiyo wakapanga mpango ya kutupeleka hospitali na sisi hatukuwa tunajichua They too had eaten their usual meal of ugali and developed similar symptoms to those of Susan and her family Tulikuwa sisi sote tunaendesha Yule msichana wa amesaliwa kwa mmoja na mume wangu ni yeye alikuwa anatapika sana Huyo alikuwa katika hali mbaya Na madaktari waliwaambia shida ilikuwa ni nini Walikuwa wametuambia tumekula mahindi ambayo iko na aflatoxin. Mlijua ni ugali mmekula ama? Hatukujua, tulipotoka hospitali. Watu wa Anglican ndio walikuja hapa nyumbani. Wakachukua mahindi wakapeleka, wakaenda wakapima, wakakaa muda wa wiki moja wakarudi tena. Wakatuambia ni mahindi. Kwa radio tunasikia kuko na watu. This family didn't know their case was part of a national tragedy. Reports of many more families flooding hospitals in Eastern Province caught the attention of everyone. The government was now calling the military to help control food poisoning in the broader Eastern region. The hospitals also waived their charges for victims of the poison to contain the disaster, which was quickly sweeping Makweni, Kitui, Machakos, Bere and Thika districts. In 2004, the weather was uh, quite uh, wet in, in, in those areas of uh, Makweni. Farmers harvested maize and uh, they were not well, well kept up. Uh, uh, post harvest management was not proper. A lot of the maize uh, were stored when they were still wet. And the aflatoxin in those maize was very high. This was not realized then until the people are dead. The shocking extent of poisoning sent ripples through the government. An outbreak of human acute aflatoxin contamination involved over 331 cases. 125 people died. It was the worst reported aflatoxin outbreak in the world. Unfortunately, um, 
one of the issues that has put Kenyan on the global map, other than our athletes, is uh, the issues around aflatoxins. We really haven't gotten it right yet. And um, you can see reports since then, maybe not as uh, to the magnitude that happened at that time, but we have had other reports since then uh, about uh, fatalities, about uh, maize being condemned in very huge uh, amounts. The Mutuku family was hospitalized for one week before they were released and put on medication. Since then, things have become even more complicated. <laughs> One of the family members discharged from the hospital developed severe health issues after the aflatoxin outbreak. In September 2010, Esther Dhambi was diagnosed with liver cancer. She died on March 2019 after battling the disease from that night, she consumed maize with aflatoxins. They are worried about who could be next. From that one meal, life has never been the same again. The top leading causes of uh, cancer of the liver in the country are the viral hepatitis, especially hepatitis B. Uh, followed by hepatitis C, which is not very common. I think, in fact, uh, aflatoxin should be the second most common cause of uh, cancer of the liver. What does it exactly do in the body, the digestive system? Mm -hmm. When uh, one takes the aflatox aflatoxin, it gets incorporated into the DNA, and then uh, it forms complexes with the DNA and then you get uh, mutations and I think it is selectively uh, ab taken up by the liver where it uh, affects the liver enzyme systems and uh, gets incorporated from the liver cells uh, to form compounds which uh, cause mutations and then uh, that leads to development of uh, cancer of the liver. The youngest life that was snuffed out with the aflatoxin contamination during that outbreak was a month-old baby. No one understood why she died, because she wasn't old enough to consume any maize meal. One of the things about aflatoxin is that you get it from ingestion. Once you ingest it, it's able to pass through uh, 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 what we call fat layers in the body. And the effects of that is that if a mother consumes food that has aflatoxin, that toxin is able to be passed to a breastfeeding baby. A mother who is pregnant that has aflatoxin in their blood, that aflatoxin is able to pass through to affect the unborn baby. Which other ways can someone consume these aflatoxins? We take porridge in a plenty. First, we give this one to our children. Gizeri is a serious one. How many times have you eaten Gizeri and uh, you even got the extreme case of a bitter maize? Have you behaved as a gentleman and swallowed the bitter maize? It is serious. I mean, it's serious for you to get to a point of, of, of the maize you're eating. It's not good. In uh, almost every school, our children are, are eating uh, Gizeri for lunch. Motokoi is uh, common. In Western Kenya, if you don't eat ugali uh, lunch or in the evening, you have slept hungry. So it amounts to almost a kilo per day per person. 
Aflatoxins are natural poisons that are produced by a group of organisms called fungi. The primary fungi that produces aflatoxins are scientifically known as aspergillus flavors and aspergillus parasiticus. It is present in the soils all over the country. But we have not understood very clearly why sometimes the production is so high. But it's the storage conditions that escalate um, make this uh, fungi begin to produce some survival spores. These spores then are, must be produced in plenty. So a single spore can multiply into millions and millions and millions, billions of them in fact, billions of them in a short time within the storage conditions. Just by the mere fact that Kenya as a country sits in the belt, you know, 35 degrees north and south of the equator, that band in itself, even when you're observing management practices to control aflatoxins, just by being within that band, you're basically predisposed. Why? Because the climatic conditions um, within that band, 35 degrees north and south of the equator, favor the growth of the fungus, the fungus that produces the toxin. This deadly poison is colorless, tasteless, and odorless. It's a cancer causing toxin. There are several uh, mycotoxins produced by fungi. And my uh, aflatoxin is the deadly one. It is the carcinogen which attacks the, the, the body system, especially the, very, the, the liver, the liver, the lungs. And that's for the humans, right? That's for the human. What about the animals? From our studies, we have seen uh, very deadly effects on poultry. It may not kill the animal because of their system, but because human beings consume milk, eggs, meat, we are able to consume aflatoxin from those meats. The global impact of the aflatoxins in maize, cereals and animal feed pushed a worldwide mycotoxin regulation as food inspectors in the US and Europe discovered meat and milk products contained unacceptable levels of this toxin through contaminated livestock feed. But how did they control it? We have very large farms in the United States. Um, where you have individual producers that work up into collectives and, and, and sell to large corporations. And so for us, one of the things that's really important about our lessons in developing Aflasafe and applying it to crops is to use the market to make sure that consumers are educated about the need to have safe food, that producers are educated about the need to have safe food. In Kenya, this is a struggle. You cannot be able to say that you shall fight it within the Kenyan boundary. And uh, we are exchanging each and every time you have transboundary trade going on. We are selling uh, maize to Tanzania, they are selling to us. The Ugandans are selling maize to us, we are selling to them. When one consumes a large amount of this toxin, aflatoxin, uh, if you take like 50 milligrams in a meal per day, you get acute aflatoxicosis, which is a uh, a serious disease that might kill somebody in, uh, in uh, 24 hours or 40, 22, 24 to 48 hours. The maximum aflatoxins level, according to the Kenya Bureau of Standards in maize, is 10 parts per billion. That's like 10 grains in a sack of a billion grains. Anything above 10 is considered to be unfit for human consumption. Look, you're in an environment where you have a proven carcinogen. A proven carcinogen means that that uh, poison is confirmed to produce um, um, toxins that are uh, cause cancer. You're in that environment. We have diets on a daily basis that we consume that are um, uh, potentially very predisposed to aflatoxin. Yeah? We have sufficient data in the country that shows the high aflatoxin levels. Yeah? Whether you're talking about maize, whether you're talking about a peanut, whether you're talking about milk, you know, we have sufficient information. 
how then can we not be able to close that link? The only way to know if the foods we consume have aflatoxins is by testing. But it is costly and we have a dietary problem. You can imagine a Kenyan family would ideally cook porridge for breakfast, maize meal, for example, and then you take a ugali or a gedheri for lunch, which has maize, and you take another portion of ugali for dinner. Yeah, the dietary exposure uh, is there, really, for, for most Kenyans. To understand the deadly aflatoxins in maize, we needed a demonstration in a lab. Scientists say there are many misconceptions about this dangerous agent in our food. This sample that looks very clean, when we analyze, it has 800 parts per billion. And remember that the regulatory threshold is 10 parts per billion. This one you'd imagine has a lot of aflatoxin in it because it's discolored. Mm -hmm. If you were to use a human judgment, but it only has two parts per billion. Yeah? So the thing which is, is below the threshold, right? Which is below the threshold of ten parts per billion. Yeah. So the idea is you cannot condemn maize, okay, uh, for a farmer by just looking at it. And that is where most people go wrong. Discolor it could even be more discoloration than this one. Some, some of them even look black. So if I take this mm -hmm. and I mix it with this, uh -huh. or a whole sack of maize, mm -hmm. this can contaminate a whole sack. If you mix with a sack of clean maize, uh, what people call blending, then this concentration is likely to change. But blending as a way of managing aflatoxins in Kenya is not permissible by law. So if I get enough, like a kilo of this, mm -hmm. and that kilo has 800 pounds per billion, mm -hmm. and I take this to a portion, mm -hmm. and I get to my maize flour, and I make ugali, mm -hmm. what can be the effect of consuming this when it's at 800 pounds per billion? 800 will not necessarily kill you, immediately, but it may give you some uh, subchronic um, or, or short-term illnesses, yeah? You may experience um, vomiting, you know, discomfort. But remember, you're, you're talking about one of incidence. Eh? You're not going to eat that food once. That's okay? just the first That's part one. That's exactly. Yes, just that, yes. I'm going to the next question. Yeah. I'm assuming I'm consuming these at once. Mm -hmm. It will not kill me. It may not kill you, but these are very high. These are very high. For sure, they will have some impact in your body that may not be visible today. These are very high, but it may not kill you. Yeah. So if I consume this over a prolonged period of time, mm -hmm. let's say a month, and I'm mm -hmm. eating ugali like every day, mm -hmm. and it has this, levels. Mm -hmm. What's the impact of that? Uh, the impact of that depends on many other factors. Okay. Uh, is it Dennis consuming that maize or whatever it is that you have made or is it um, your little child because you, you basically respond differently. How much can you take as an adult and how much can you take as a child? So there are many other um, factors that would determine how you respond to consistent uh, weekly, you know, a consumption of one week of this amount of aflatoxin. So yeah? this one as a grown-up may not kill me, but for a child it could. It could, but even for you as a grown-up, it is slowly um, uh, destroying some of the essential organs like the liver. Yeah? So, so ultimately, Obviously. This could potentially lead to liver cancer. Not potentially. Obviously, it will eventually lead to liver cancer. Obviously. Wow. Yeah. You see this? This is amazing. Mm -hmm. Now, one kernel, this one, could potentially have five parts per billion of aflatoxin. Okay? This kernel that I've put here. 
if I pick this other candle and it's in the same sample that has come to the lab, could have 10,000 parts per billion. Wow. Yes. Okay? A candle. 10,000 parts per 10, billion. 10,000 parts per billion. So what does that mean? If you do not sample properly mm -hmm. and you pick maize where the uh, candle with five parts per billion was and forget to pick the one that had uh, 10,000 parts per billion, you get two readings. You're likely to get two readings from the same sample. Okay. Which one is correct? For example, in Meru County, which is hard hit by aflatoxin, we have a miller who rejects almost 60% of the maize that is brought by farmers because of uh, aflatoxin levels. You always said 90% of this maize goes through the informal markets. Yes. And that's where most Kenyans uh, buy, buy their maize. Yes. How many farmers do this? How many farmers do even know that this, this is important? A testing? Yes. Hardly. What is the incentive for the farmer other than knowing that what you're consuming can harm you? Yeah? They will test, yes, and then do they throw? Where do they take it to? The highest levels here I'm seeing is the 800 parts per billion. Mm -hmm. What's the highest that you've tested? The highest that we have tested is 20,000 parts per billion. 20,000 <laughs> parts? Yes. 20,000 parts per billion. In the previous season, not too long ago, when um, there was a lot of media coverage on uh, peanut butter that was being confiscated because of 24 parts per billion, we were dealing with samples in the laboratory that had 1,000 parts per billion recently. Yeah? And these are from farmers' fields. In the 2004 and 2005 outbreak, many who lost their lives are said to have consumed maize with aflatoxin levels that ranged from 12,000 parts per billion to 40,000 parts per billion. That is 12,000% and 40,000% above the safe limit. It is so potent that we talk about quantities in parts per billion, micrograms per kilogram, very small units. Very, very small but toxic units. The ripple effect of this poison on humans, livestock and poultry has led to more research over the years and the findings are disturbing. A 2017 study titled Exposure of Kenyan Population to Aflatoxins in Foods with particular reference to Nandi and Makweni counties focused on children younger than five years as the proxy. The two counties were picked based on their history of human acute aflatoxicosis. A total of 67 and 98 human breast milk samples were collected from Nandi and Makweni respectively. 86.7% and 56.7% of these samples were positive for aflatoxin M1 strain in Makweni and Nandi counties. Apart from consuming homegrown contaminated maize, the other source of these high levels of aflatoxin M1 in breast milk is the consumption of cow milk contaminated with aflatoxin M1. The presence of aflatoxin in cow milk is a result of these animals consuming contaminated feeds. Spoiled maize was used as an animal feed across these two counties. What the cows will eat will be aflatoxin B1, which in the body of a cow will be metabolized to aflatoxin M1 and it will be in milk. And what happens if a baby drinks the milk or anyone just drinks the milk? You are exposing the kid to, to is a carcinogenic compound. The baby will be sick. They will have, if it is liver cancer, they will get liver cancer. And if it will damage other organs, it will damage other organs. For lactating mothers have eaten maize, which was contaminated by this maize, or by this aflatoxin, then the milk that goes into the infant being is more, it has 
the, the refined source of it, leading to problems of standardness in children or even death. Aflatoxin is a, a problem which needs to be tackled uh, like yesterday. 2018 was the second best performing year for the dairy industry in 18 years. More people are consuming milk in the country. The volume of milk bought by the five leading processors, that is Brookside, New KCC, Gidunguri, Meru and Kinangop, accounted for more than 80% of all the formal milk intake in the country. The informal market is also growing and controls enormous volumes of milk production, therefore causing stiff competition. The quality of raw milk handled by the informal traders is worrying food experts. Look at the milk we take, we take at our, our, our supermarkets. Instead of people going for UHT, which is ultra heat treated, bacteria have been killed, they go to the milk ATMs. You know the milk ATMs? Uh, you're going to get uh, uh, cheap milk there. If it's raw milk, then uh, you are actually buying a lot of bacteria inside there. And if you, if you don't boil that milk immediately, you are likely to suffer from uh, many other conditions like brucellosis, uh, cause abortions. Are again. these things that you've tested? Yeah, yes. In fact, uh, to shock you, at the milk ATM, you don't see a cab smack, you don't see a public health officer there, you don't see a dairy inspector there. It's an area that's grey, currently nobody seems to control it. It worries me because I do not know whether that milk, from where it was milked to where I come to milk it into my container, has gone through the necessary quality um, um, control systems. Yeah? Nobody knows. We assume that um, whether it's a supermarket chain or whatever outlet it is, has taken care of that. Yeah? That is our assumption. So if there's a gap by the entity that has been entrusted to ensure that that commodity is safe, then woe unto you. In 2018, the International Livestock Research Institute published a risk assessment report of aflatoxin M1 exposure in low- and middle-income dairy consumers in Kenya. The report assessed the risk of cancer and stunting as a result of aflatoxin M1 consumption in Nairobi, using worst-case assumptions of toxicity and data from previous studies. They found that almost all 99.5% of milk was contaminated with aflatoxin M1. Cancer risk caused by aflatoxin M1 was lower among consumers purchasing milk from formal markets than low-income consumers purchasing milk from informal markets. The study further said 2.7% of children could hypothetically be stunted due to aflatoxin M1 exposure from milk. I get worried uh, because by the end of the day, every day I see my children take milk, a glass of milk every day. And I ask myself, who fed this cow? Because by the end of the day, if our animals are feeding on a on contaminated pro product, yeah? if by chance we happen to produce milk with a maize and other products that are already contaminated, it will also pass to me. All of us are not safe. We have to fight it. Are you scared when you eat your ugali, gideri, or you drink your milk? Personally, I take a lot of tea. And my wife keep on telling me, you know, you take a lot of tea and you guys are telling us about aflatoxin. Then I look at my children are taking the same milk. And all of us every day, Kenyans are very good consumer of milk. And we have a case to be worried. While reporting on contaminated milk, the Departmental Committee on Agriculture, Lands and Natural Resources in the 10th Parliament discovered a startling fact. There was a brand of milk, I don't want to name it, and if somebody, my name is John Mutudo, Honorable John Mutudo, check me out, I'll tell you which factory it was and which it was. We checked it out, there was all the milk samples we took from that factory had aflatoxins and it was in the supermarket. Because the farmers there 
uh, using feeds of maize, which are aphrotoxins, my brother. Well, it, it's not rocket science. It's that basic. What did you do when you found out the factory? We reported to them. We reported to the authorities. There is promised action, like the promised this afternoon, blah, 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 blah. Nothing happened to that factory because of powerful political connections. Despite tons of evidence of aflatoxin levels, the findings were ignored. The report was never published. Food experts and medical personnel are now saying that over 60% of diseases we see in hospitals are coming from the foods we grow and eat. Today, the cancer cases are rising at an alarming rate and children are the most vulnerable. From about 2014, I actually uh, had issues of... Uh, I started thinking about why do our patients get sicker for common diseases. Children around the world have very similar illnesses, but for the same illnesses, children in our part of the world tend to be sicker. They get diarrhea, it's more severe. Diarrhea is a common killer, it's the second biggest killer of children in this country and many other countries like ours, particularly in Africa, low-income countries. Things like pneumonia is more severe. Same diseases in the Western world Doctors say the exposure of aflatoxin in children happens in all their life courses. The problem, they say, is that not many practicing clinicians have a good understanding of aflatoxin beyond a topic in medical textbooks. And because some of its presentation resemble many of the other diseases, it's hidden amongst those other diseases. A study was done on, on blood, human blood, to find out how who has, uh, uh, who has uh, aflatoxin flowing in their system, in their blood. People took blood for other things, but I think a study was, uh, a parallel study was done. In the US, they say 1.3% 1 .3 of, the, of the population of 2,000, which was tested, tested positive for aflatoxins, whereas in Kenya, I think some years in the past, about 78% of 3,000 people who are tested, 78% uh, of them have had a platoxin. So it means we are living in an environment where there's a lot of it. We took some samples across um, the, the marketplace, just samples of food that we, people will eat regularly, like maize meal. And just analyze to see whether it was safe. We found almost every foodstuff has uh, some contaminants to levels that are significant in terms of um, yeah, being able to lead to disease problems, foodborne illnesses. Dr. Gidanga went back to Makweni County to check if anything had changed since the 2004 aflatoxin outbreak as part of his study on the emerging evidence of direct effects of mycotoxins to the immune system of children. Children who are developing the immunity that get exposed to aflatoxin, their immune response is blunted. The ability to protect themselves from diseases is, 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 is not as good as it should be. And what is the consequences of that? What's the consequence of actually having suppressed immunity? It means that when children whose commonest cause of death, if you look at probably six of the ten commonest causes of death in children, they are infection related. If you look at what infections, you're really talking about uh, things like pneumonia, which is a lower respiratory tract infection, diarrhea and vomiting are two big killers. In our setup, a lot more kids die from those two diseases compared to the same diseases in the Western world. The question is, is there something about the immunity that is not good? In the published study done in 2016 and 2017 that focused on children between 1 and 14 years, Dr. Gidanga found some shocking results after random screening of 433 children in the area. 
all the children have aflatoxin levels. All of yeah. them, yes. All of them, 100% had aflatoxin. The differences were in the levels, right? Some had, bulk of them had fairly low levels, but the majority, the, a few had fairly high levels. But these are kids running around. They're not, they're not sick, they're not in the hospital. So what does that mean? I want the future, that they, they are grow up. chronically exposed to aflatoxin. And this particular test that we did actually measures your aflatoxin exposure over three months. But if the doses are small doses of a long period, uh, that is a chronic af aflatoxicosis, then that is when you develop cancer, cancers of the liver, other things that also come. The case of 2004 was acute poisoning, but today the problem is much bigger. Then we have what we call chronic exposure, which uh, in my opinion is where the problem is. And this is where um, people consume not very high amounts of aflatoxin, but amounts of aflatoxin that are beyond uh, the permissible threshold, now that is scientific, eh? beyond the allowable um, uh, threshold that has been set for safety. And um, eventually with time, the cumulative effect of these toxins in their body leads to complications like cancer, particularly the liver cancer. The other food commodity is peanuts, or what we call groundnuts. Yeah? Those two are also very common substrates or food commodities that the fungus thrives on. Yeah? When it is thriving on those food commodities, it can also produce the poison. Now, uh, so if your diet is largely a maize-based diet, then you have every reason to worry about uh, contamination and subsequent uh, consumption of food that is contaminated with aflatoxin. The first record of aflatoxin in Kenya was reported in 1960. 16,000 ducklings from white settler farms in Rift Valley province died from aflatoxin-contaminated groundnut feed. The second time was in 1977, when 100 dogs died in Nairobi, Mombasa and Eldred from industrially processed foods which had been contaminated with aflatoxins. The scare forced dog food companies to put labels of quality assurance on their products. The first recorded acute human aflatoxicosis outbreak was reported in 1981. Twelve people died after eating high aflatoxin contaminated food. In 1984 and 1985, a large number of poultry died after being fed imported contaminated maize. Since then, reported deaths have been registered in Meru North, Maua, Fika, Mutomo, Makindu, Kibwezi and several other places in the country. If you sample at the household's storage where we store our maize, the household still you find that uh, we have our maize contaminated. And uh, in some regions it's worse than other regions of this country. When you go to Nyamakima, which store do you see? Do you see any store where we are talking about it is well ventilated, it is what? But you see, Nyamakima is handling 70% of what people are eating in Nairobi. So if people are not using good storage structures, what do you expect in this country? It is in the, this one is in the capital city. Everybody is watching when people are not using proper storage structures. Everybody is going to buy those things and they are eating. And because they don't understand the consequences of aflatoxin contamination. I just checked the peanuts and checked some maize. Personally, and I used my money to check that. And I saw it was uh, having a high contamination of over 30. 30 parts per billion. That's in peanuts? In peanuts, yes. When the government, through the Interior Ministry, issued a warning to consumers that Nati's peanut butter had surpassed the required limit of aflatoxin, many were taken by surprise. A report by the government chemist explained that 
the number of aflatoxins found in the peanut butter was more than double the maximum limit. They found 24.08 parts per billion. Peanuts are very, most of them are very susceptible, especially, especially crown nuts. Those are susceptible crops. And unfortunately, they are handled very casually in this country. The procedure even of handling, how they prepare them, how they carry them, where they are stored is a problem. The other notorious practice, especially in the peanut industry, is to sort the peanuts and grind the bad peanuts uh, to have peanut butter. Because, you know, peanut butter as a product, you cannot tell whether it was made from bad uh, peanut or not. Those are not solutions. Rather, they are scapegoats and they are costly. Because ultimately, you and me consume uh, these products. There is no such thing as entirely safe food. But experts say the problem lies in continuous exposure to anything unsafe in the food chain. The effects may not be felt immediately, but later. To find out how much Kenyans are exposed to aflatoxins, we decided to get samples from the country's staple, maize. To find out how much Kenyans are exposed to aflatoxins, we decided to get samples from the country's staple, maize. There are over 40 brands of maize and wheat flour in many retail shops and supermarkets across the country. We bought 12 random samples to test for aflatoxins. Only 250 grams of flour per package was needed for testing and we labeled the kits using the first 12 alphabets. For credible results, the people analyzing the samples didn't know where the samples were coming from. As we waited for the results, we traveled to the Rift Valley. The grain basket of the country all the experts we interviewed agree that aflatoxin contamination is higher in the villages than in towns. But what brought us here was a study that was conducted at the Moy Teaching and Referral Hospital in Eldred to determine whether aflatoxin exposure in Kenyan women was associated with increased detection of human papilloma virus HPV leading to cervical cancer. This is a very common virus that infects women during their lifetime. And it is, it, it is as common as a woman has a chance of getting it, it's 80% in her lifetime. But most of them uh, clear it uh, through their immunity. They, they, they are able to fight it and within two years of getting infected it is it's gone. But there is a 5% of women who get it and it remains for long and eventually becomes cervical cancer. So we were wondering, why this 5%? What is so unique about these women who end up getting cancer of the cervix? We've been doing research on uh, the causes of cervical cancer in this region, and um, we, 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 to try and understand why is it that common here? Why is it killing more women? Medical records at the hospital that serves the Rift Valley region and adjacent areas show grim statistics of the total number of inpatient and outpatient cancer cases from 2016 to 2018. The total number of cancer cases in 2016 was 1,664. 266 people died that year. In 2017, there were 1,712 cases of cancer. 458 people died. In 2018, that number doubled and cancer cases rose to 2,831. 
Out of that number, 547 people died. The outpatient cancer cases seen from 2016 to 2018, both new and old, saw a total of 39,218 cancer patients visit the hospital. In 2017, the hospital recorded 11,969 cancer cases. In 2018, that figure rose to 18,605. Why was this research done here? This research about the role that aflatoxin might have in the causation of cancer of the cervix, which is in the reproductive um, health tract of the, of the women, was done here because that is actually the leading cancer in MTRH. Among the patients that we see here, who, are, who eventually get admitted for one reason or the other, cancer of the cervix, is, which is the female reproductive uh, tract or um, organ, is the leading cause of admission among the cancers. Since 2016, 2017 and 2018, the inpatient data from the hospital shows the top three cancers are cervical, followed by breast and ovarian cancer. The reality of how the wards here have seen the ravages of cancer is too hard to take in. The numbers doesn't begin to describe the pain of what these women have to go through every day and night. This disturbing increase led a team of doctors and researchers to enroll women from September 2015 to October 2016 at the hospital to investigate factors that could contribute to the risk of HPV leading to cervical cancer. This group of researchers picked on it apart from the numbers they were trying to see what else in the environment could be supporting this. And you know, we come from a region near the North Rift, which is the grain basket of the country, with a lot of maize, wheat and all that. And sometimes some of the maize particularly had been found to be affected by aflatoxin. So we wanted to see, could this also be explaining the rise in the cancers in this region? So we wanted to say, could it be associated with the cancer of the cervix as well as a cofactor, as something that either promotes or does something. We encourage women who came for screening for cervical cancer. One, they have no cancer, they don't have a problem on the cervix, so they are, we would pass for a clean bill of health in that aspect. But then we would test them for presence of human papilloma virus from their cervix and also took blood and tested for presence of aflatoxin to try and correlate whether the presence of aflatoxin encouraged the presence of human papilloma virus. And our findings were rather stunning. We were shocked uh, uh, at our findings. We found out that for women who had detectable aflatoxin in their blood, had high chances of in, uh, harboring human papilloma virus. And the higher the aflatoxin levels, the higher the chances of detecting the high-risk human papilloma virus that causes cancer of the cervix. So we did not for sure go out to find whether it causes cancer, aflatoxin causes cancer. No, our there study did not. There's an association, it's an issue of association. That's, and that's how most researchers start. The women aged between 18 to 45 years were followed up for four years in the five-year study. The researchers collected cervical swabs for HPV testing and also collected blood samples for aflatoxin testing in the U.S. The results were sent back to Kenya. I have the results here that 49 women out of 88, that comes to 57%, had detectable aflatoxin. So you have 88 women whom we took who are okay, who, are, who had come for other businesses in the hospital or were walking around, and we recruited to these studies, 57% of them had detectable uh, aflatoxin. That's very high. The average in the U.S. is below 2%. And then here you are with all the usual women who are minding their own businesses, whom we screened and did not have a problem, test their aflatoxin in their serum, 57% had detectable aflatoxin. That's very high. Did the findings surprise you? 
a little bit because it was for the first time actually in, in Kenya and perhaps in Africa that aflatoxin now was coming in as a possible, what we call a supporting carcinogen, one supporting or associated, not necessarily the cause, but supporting causation of cancer of the cervix. Because even when we went to the medical school and all along, we have known human papilloma virus for many years as a cause for cancer of the cervix. But aflatoxin, to the best of my recollection and my knowledge to date, there is no other study that had been carried out to see whether it has a role to play. We meet Mary Chamor, who is waiting for appointment with her doctor. She started feeling unwell in 2015 and for one year made numerous trips to various hospitals but still didn't know what was ailing her. In 2016, doctors broke the news. The very day that my doctor told me that um, I had cancer, that was the darkest day in my life. Because I, I remember when, when he just said uh, cancer and then it's like everything else was a blur. I, I couldn't even understand what he was trying to say. And for me, I was like now, my, my life just started you know, going through my head, oh, now I'm done. If it's cancer, then I'm, I'm, I'm finished. Uh, I remember uh, walking from here to town, and I can't remember how I got home. Mary was screened here at Moi Teaching and Referral Hospital. Fortunately for her, the cancer was at stage 1B. I'm one of the very few blessed and lucky women cervical cancer uh, patient that has been able to survive. Um, just this year, my doctor declared me cancer-free. For other patients, stigma in the village and the fear of what they will have to go through forces them not to disclose to family members what is ailing them. This woman was also diagnosed with cervical cancer. She didn't want to be identified. I came for my first review after two weeks. I thought I was okay. The doctor Isura told me, uh, Madam, things are not good here. You still have some cells here. And before that, I had heard stories of some cells, radi radiology, whatever came on. I had heard of them. So those were stories, but now I'm the one. I just went straight to my son, my mother. I had already pictured how these guys will be crying and screaming for because of my death. I already knew this is death. How can I go? She joins Mary as one of those fortunate ones to be declared cancer-free by her doctor as they both attend counseling sessions. We're hitting a red flag that in, in, in cervical cancer, the culprit is human papilloma virus. But we found the people who have human, high risk human papilloma virus also have high levels of aflatoxin. Why, why, why like that? And the ones who don't have uh, high levels don't have. Then the Mexico people, then they went into the cancer itself, found very high levels of aflatoxin in the cervical cancer smears. There must be a relationship. So it's high time researchers and policymakers looked at that and said, what, what can we do? Unfortunately, uh, in many cases, experts Although we have the knowledge and the, the information that can help everyone, we are not, never taken seriously. In this country, uh, people who are taken seriously could be politicians. They will say something and people listen. We have cases in this country where you, you will see even a, a maze condemnation uh, report being debated by politicians rather than experts. One man tried it and his journey ended before it could even start. Politics reared its ugly head and he found himself fighting a losing battle. Former KEBS MD, Dr. Engineer Sami Kyoko Mangeli, in this video footage that recently went viral, had a warning on the effects of contaminated maize in the country. This maize eventually was consumed by Kenyans. Are you fearful that Kenyans may have consumed maize that contains 
aflatoxin? I'm more than 100% sure that it affects people and that within the next 10 to 15 years, we will also have serious cases of cancer based on this miss. But was he right? He was uh, right. And I'm also right today when I say if you now do proper application, he predicted that in 10, 15 years, there will be cancer prevalent in, uh, uh, in the country because of contamination of aflatoxin. The same way now we are telling Kenyans, let us review that in the next 10, 15 years, we should also be able to bring down the reforce of cancer. To some extent, uh, he was right. And especially with the climate change, with the climate warming up, we expect more cases of uh, aflatoxin contamination in our maze because the temperatures are going up. In that shocking statement, while being interviewed by 33 MPs in 2009, Mangeli also said Kenyans had been feeding on contaminated maize since 2008 with the full knowledge of the government. He told the Parliamentary Committee on Agriculture that KEBS had rejected the shipment of this maize from South Africa at the port of Mombasa over safety concerns. Another consignment from the U.S. also had issues, but it still docked in Mombasa and was ready for offloading. It is not acceptable within the political system or within the societal setup that 13.5% moisture content of maize can be put in the market and be used by people to produce goods. Despite these concerns, the Kebs MD found himself cornered by what he called powerful forces in government that wanted the controversial maize cleared from the port of Mombasa. We summoned Mangeri many times. We visited him in the laboratories and interviewed him. So I had invited him to highlight some of the technical issues, particularly to do with the GMO and aflatoxins in the maize that was imported, and the issue of clearance, the age of the grain. MTV Investigates obtained a letter that was written by Mangeli dated March 30, 2009, requesting to appear before the committee that was investigating the controversial maize consignment at the port. It was the second time he was appearing before the committee to give more details about the consignment. He also cited reasons that had left him traumatized that we can't air because of its sensitivity, but he indicated that he was under extreme pressure psychologically. Before the interview he had, uh, I had taken through a, like a counseling session. I reassured him that he be, all will be well in Parliament and he should answer freely and openly. It took me about 14 days to persuade him. We had several lunches with him to try to persuade him. He was dejected. He seemed uh, betrayed by his own country. <clears throat> he seems like uh, his bosses had uh, stabbed him right on behind his back and right to where it matters. They had messed up his businesses, his career. He, he was a very sad man, basically. What you, see, what you see in the interview is now his best form that particular time. It took us time. But a human being beyond this point is not advisable, is not acceptable. Actually, it is um, degrading the dignity of a Kenyan, telling a Kenyan to consume maize beyond 13.5%. The moisture content Mangeli was referring to was referenced in a letter dated February 3rd, 2009. He wrote to Professor Gideon Misoy, the managing director of the National Cereals and Produce Board, raising the issue about numerous consultations with concerned agencies, foreign and national, regarding the quality of importation and distribution of maize from the United States. In one paragraph he said, and I quote, from past experiences, maize with moisture contents of more than 13.5% have resulted in the development of molds and produce aflatoxins that have adverse effects to both animals and human beings. The letter was copied to several senior people in government. Still, in another letter of caution on the same day, Mangeli officially wrote to the PS Ministry of Agriculture raising the same concerns of moisture content of the yellow corn as a feed grain, saying, 
Considering the above and taking into account the mode of transport is by sea, which can lead to addition of moisture from the sea, the levels of the moisture could be higher by the time it's arriving at the port of entry. He again insisted on compliance with the maize. All the maize that came through one ship that had one of its, one of its chambers opened had aflatoxin, dangerous aflatoxin levels. And uh, that maize ended up in our stores and was sold. They were not fit for human consumption. It was an international scandal to have that maize consumed in Kenya. And that's why you're having all these cancer things now. Let Engineer Mangeli repeated it. Did anybody listen to them? No. Mangeli said during the grilling session that the government ignored cabs and gave the responsibility of testing that maize consignment to CAFIS, which gave the maize a clean bill of health, despite not having machines for testing, as this document indicates, and I quote, Currently, the machines for testing aflatoxins are out of order. Though being repaired, they are using SGS lab subcontracting. Did you ever go to the port of Mombasa and what did you see with regards to the issues that Kyoko Mangeli had raised? We met people offloading the ships. We stopped the offloading. Normally, a committee in parliament will not do that, but we forced the agencies to, to stop offloading of staff. We, we did everything humanly possible. Like I'm saying, I thank Mr. Speaker Marende because at one time, like that time when they were offloading that toxic maze, he organized for our flights to Mombasa within 30 minutes. Did they stop? They stopped. But immediately we left, did they continue? Two weeks later, I understand the ship went and then came back anew. People in Kenya have this bad habit. Maize is rejected from Mombasa, then it makes a long U-turn. Deep Seas comes back with new fresh papers. Now it's accepted again. That one we proved. Somebody else, after all this, wait until we are, everything is quiet, the ship comes at night and it's offloaded. Through through some warehouses there which were leased to a very influential person. This is how bad we are. There's no need of us pretending. Beth Mugo, who was the Minister for Public Health and Sanitation, issued a press statement. The 6,254.53 metric tons of contaminated maize is unfit for human and animal consumption. We are afraid that the maize could already be in circulation. The ministry never gave authority for the contaminated maize to be offloaded. As the battle scattered around several offices, including the office of the prime minister, which was implicated in the maize consignment and parliament and the line ministries, there is no record of the maize being destroyed. Who gave instructions? for the maize to be offloaded. And when the maize was offloaded, was the maize destroyed? There was another disturbing revelation. The report from the Parliamentary Committee on Agriculture said, and I quote, all maize imported to Kenya for human consumption or otherwise are 90% GMO. This is against the backdrop that the contract or tender specification was for the importation of GMO-free maize. Out of eight ships that docked in Mombasa between September 2008 and February 2009, seven had delivered GMO maize mostly from India and South Africa. We have Kenyans, I believe, who are dying because they consumed that maize that we imported from South Africa. The amount of maize that we imported those 10 years ago was certainly consumed and finished. So the time when you were trying to debate that on the floor of the house, yeah. on the other side, what was happening to engineer Kyoko Mangeli? He was now being crucified. He was being harassed left, right, centre. His business was going down. But he kept on working on that. He was very respected overseas. He had nothing else to lose. He had lost his job. Everybody was after him, and they wanted somebody just to slap a stamp. The Kebs MD was a man under siege with a myriad of issues and other allegations, but in and out of Parliament, his status as Kebs MD 
became the subject of many debates and contradictions. Who is the managing director of Kenya Bureau of Standard as it stands now? The report on food security status and the maize shortage in the country became heated. Can you confirm, further confirm that out of that, it turned into a political discourse rather than fact-checking what Kenyans were going to consume with allegations that some MPs were bribed to kill the motion. In fact, they received bribes inside parliament itself. And when I was debating that evening, I could see one gentleman there with a big bag up there in the speaker's gallery, dishing cash. Are you surprised that by the time we were voting for the report, initially we started as 22 members of parliament, in parliament. They all disappeared. I was left with uh, Rotere, Mushima Rotere, who also worked out. Eventually I was alone, 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 debating against the likes of Olengo, the likes of Raira, the likes of Ndimama, and all the other, 72 of them, the other side. Imagine, John Mutudo against 72 members there, and then every debate in parliament ends with a vote. So all of them received the money right there in Parliament? I saw members receiving money. How much were they getting? I don't know. It's very painful. And you are seeing up there what's happening. And the person doing it is a member of Parliament? No. Or is an outsider? He's an outsider. And we were there up to six. Yeah, yeah, even my friends, Kina Jakoyo Midiwa, I could see they were sympathizing with me. Not that they are evil. But this is politics. <clears throat> you have this debate here, touching maybe on the power of people, the other side. Where was PNU troop that time, that day? That particular time, we had members of parliament who were given money. They were part of the people who eased the, the, the flow of the maize into the market. And some were paid 18, 16, 15 million shillings. We didn't get a coin, we are still here. Our budget in the ministry, in the parliament for Per year, the Committee of Agriculture was 14 to 15 billion, million. 14 to 15 million per annum. But this particular report was audited for 25 million shillings, the one that we did. Just like the one we did for KPCU and, and so forth and so on. That shows how unfair things can be. But we stand to our guns. Today, the report is still there. It was rejected. It was not retabled again because now I didn't have the numbers. Politics won, and the truth lost the fight. Kyoko Mangeli was sacked as the Kebs MD on 12th September 2009. His dramatic exit was hastily arranged in a boardroom as his successor took over. The war about this was a terrible war. It was a war, not a battle. We won it at the end, and we had people. And those people who are hurt now must come back and fight us. We agree. We are in power. We don't have, I don't even mind being squeezed out of position. I, I mean, I will not burn here. And I will not stay here forever. Kyoko Mangeli later died on 14th March 2019. A few months before he died, he had uh, he developed a condition because of that those frustrations. They were not paying him. There they were a lot of issues, a lot of issues. We need to remember uh, individuals like Mangeri, who stood alone, without the support of anybody, to come and tell us that the maize that has come is poison for Kenyans. He died there after because he was thrown out of office, put at a very severe, uh, whatever, until he died of depression. The aflatoxin issue is beyond maize. Its presence and effects on human health will be a subject of future studies. Each region manifests different challenges. We need to do more studies to what we normally call more work in this area to try and understand the role of aflatoxin and I want to say a lot of work also in this region is going on on cancer of the esophagus, which is one of the leading cancers that we see here. Cancer of the esophagus, there is a belt from the South Rift to the North Rift to Western Kenya, where we see, and this is the area that is covered by Moi Teaching and Referral Hospital as the National Referral Hospital. We see a number of cases of cancer of the esophagus, 
and questions have been asked whether, particularly in Bomet and Kericho, is it because of Mursik, the you know the fermented milk, or is it because of some other environmental chemical that is used, for example, in in tea plantations or busa, and what so far you know the the studies that have been published in that area show is that maybe it is not mursik per se but it could be the the fermentation itself because fermentation comes up with some form of alcohol you remember fermentation leads to alcohol production and that can explain then this belt from south rift to north rift to western kenya because there is some busa consumption and other forms of alcohol also that's the common thing that is there in that uh, region. We have a report in our possession on several brands of alcohol in the country that were found with detectable levels of aflatoxin. It was never published because it is alleged the industry fought back. There was testing for 883 components, possible components which are there, from heavy metals, down to afrotoxins, and I said I found afrotoxins, I'm telling you, I found afrotoxins in Kenyan beer. It's that simple. If you doubt it, you go test yourselves. You take that beer, your favorite, check whether there are any afrotoxins. Dr. Mangeri's lab did it. What is the point of us pouring for the four million liters of alcohol, bad alcohol? What's the point of us pouring that? When we cannot control afrotoxin milk, Afrotoxin beer, Afrotoxin sausages. What's the point? Back to the 12 samples we bought in Nairobi for testing aflatoxins. We bought these random brands that Kenyans consume to analyze if there are any detectable levels of aflatoxin. The government chemist tested the 12 samples. We were issued with the certificate of analysis. The 250 grams packages were coded and labeled A to L, respectively, and the lab did not know the origin of the samples. The ELISA method of validation was used by the government chemist to test for the aflatoxins. The current KEBS standards for aflatoxins is 10 parts per billion. Sample A, which was familiar baby winning porridge mix, had 1.68 parts per billion. Sample B, which was X all-purpose wheat flour, had 0, 0.00. Sample C, which was Jim B maize meal, had 16.28 parts per billion. Sample D, which was Tetema premium maize flour, had 5.99. Sample E, which was dollar maize meal, had 1.93 parts per billion. Sample F, which was Ndovu home baking flour, had no aflatoxins. Sample G, which was hostess maize meal, was found with 1.38 parts per billion. Sample H, which was Ajab home baking flour, had 0, 0.00 parts per billion. The sample I, which was Jogo maize meal, was found with 13.87 parts per billion of aflatoxins. Sample J, which was Kifaru ungawa ugali, had no aflatoxins. Sample K, which was hairy sifted maize meal, had 16.19 aflatoxins in parts per billion. The last sample L, which was dollar home baking flour, had 0, 0.00 aflatoxins. Experts say the reason why the wheat flour readings appear negative is because of various reasons. Among them, the fungus that produce aflatoxins prefer maize as a substrate or food source than wheat which has a small surface area for colonization. But there are other mycotoxins that are common in wheat. Out of the 12 samples we tested, three had high aflatoxin levels above the Kenyan standards. But seven samples still had detectable levels of aflatoxin and in four, none was found. Three samples out of 12, yes. she say 25 percent have failed the limits. But others, although they are within limits, they tested positive. In essence, we are saying that 75 percent 
of the maize out there is contaminated. But what level? We are saying that uh, another 25% should actually be not be placed on the shelf. This is a very poor score. Maize is our, our step of food, and if you are sure of only 25% of it, then there's a problem. Looking at the percentage, I know we, that, 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 that I think that is representative of what we have in the in the in the markets. Because I also, as an organization, we do uh, we sample uh, maize and other products for our own consumption, and sometimes you find that. The, the levels are higher than what is recommended. What you're saying is, if we see that maize flour in a packet, in a shop or a supermarket or anywhere else, yeah. if it has small levels of flatoxin, if they continue storing it badly, badly, the levels... The levels can go up. Can go up. Yeah. The levels that we have witnessed sometimes are higher than that by far. The fungus that produces the toxin can continue multiplying, okay? The toxin is a chemical, okay? It's very heat stable, by the way, and, and that is why you cannot tell farmers, cook your maize so that you kill the toxin. It's very stable. While in Eldred, we also bought dry white maize from a local push mill which we later milled and took our flour to Nairobi for testing. Many people in the villages use the local posh mills and for many, this is a healthy maize mill. We picked another sample from Makweni after visiting another local posh mill where most villagers get their maize and flour. It is affordable and many families buy the maize flour here we chose Makweni because of its history with battling aflatoxins. We took the samples from the two regions to the government chemist and the test results showed that the maize flour from the Eldred Poshu Mill had 1.90 parts per billion of aflatoxins. The maize flour from Makweni County had 5.60 parts per billion. The two test results from the Makweni and Eldred Poshu mills, which represent the informal market, show the aflatoxin levels to be below the 10 parts per billion Kenyan standard. But because there are no quality management systems to monitor the process, it's impossible to get accurate data because no one monitors the source of maize and its quality. For years now, the maize crop has been under full-scale assault by aflatoxins. The journey takes from a farmer growing the maize, harvesting, storage, transportation, milling and storage in shops is a complex one, especially when contamination is difficult to trace by regulators. The man who inherited this mess is hoping to turn things around despite his ministry being haunted by the ghosts of a system that favored profit margins than the health of its citizens. If you look at the losses this country is going through, for example, last year on, whereby we destroyed 2.3 million bags of maize because of contamination. One is the loss as a country, because assuming they would have only sold their maize for 2,000 Kenya shillings, that means that we destroyed maize worth more than 4.6 billion. For the farmers, there is a glimmer of hope. This center in Machakos is trying to fight aflatoxin by directly engaging farmers and introducing a fungus that will fight aflatoxin during planting seasons. It's called aflasafe. The amount of money we have set for subsidies this year, we are going to set 20% for aflatoxin. And what we are doing is we are going to team up with those governors with those county governments that are willing to help their people so that over time they can see the importance. And I can assure you that this is tested. It is one of the best facilities that we have now had in the country and is the second in Africa. 
Nigeria, which is also affected by aflatoxin contamination, was the first country in Africa to come up with this kind of facility. You cannot be able to say that you shall fight it within the Kenyan boundary. And uh, we are exchanging each and every time you have transboundary trade going on. We are selling uh, maize to Tanzania, they are selling to us. The Ugandans are selling maize to us, we are selling to them. For consumers, it can sound like a hard nut to crack, but perhaps simple ideas can go a mighty long way. A dietary diversification is one way to manage um, contamination. Yeah. So, so I do that. There is a chance that some of the old farming practices and knowledge of the crop stemmed the problem of aflatoxin. But in today's context, there are many activities and many loopholes that are aggravating the problem of aflatoxins. Food safety issues are not too obvious to the eye, but the effects will be felt for generations to come. Dennis Okari, NTV Investigates.